So what did we say we were going to do during this chapter? Define GDP, look at the circular flow model, introduce you to two different ways of measuring GDP, either in terms of an income approach or an expenditure approach. Look at the difference between nominal GDP and real GDP. And then also, we haven't got to this yet, but talk about what we mean by economic growth. And having understood what we mean by economic growth, get an idea as to why just focusing on, say, economic growth is not necessarily all that informative in terms of our overall economic well-being. So we did the first couple of these bullet points. We kind of stopped at, on this nominal and real GDP point, and we'll be continuing there today. Just a brief look one more time at our circular flow diagram. If you recall, we have households, we have firms, we have government, we have the rest of the world. They all interact through either the factor market, the factor market is where production happens, the goods market is where goods and services get sold, and the financial market is where financial assets and financial instruments get traded. Where we left off was on this slide, and the example that we had spoken about was some make-believe economy that sold 100 units of, what was it, cell phones, and the cell phones each cost 1,000 rand. If they each cost 1,000 rand, and the only thing that we produce is cell phones, and we produced 100 cell phones during one year, then we said we could measure our GDP as 100,000 rand, and I think 100,000 rand we said was going to be 2017's GDP. We then said, what happens if our GDP in 2018 becomes 200,000 Rand? What we wanted to know was whether there was any real GDP growth. And by real GDP growth, what we mean is, are we producing and selling more stuff? Okay, that's what real GDP growth means. And we realized pretty quickly that 200,000, well, just by looking at the number 200,000 and comparing it to the number 100,000, there was a problem because that increase in the value, the market value of the goods and services sold could have come from two different sources. Either we could be producing more or the price of the things that we were producing and selling could have gone up, right? So the first thing we said was, well, what happens if that 200,000 Rand GDP in 2018 came with an increase in prices instead of being 1,000 Rand per cell phone sold, it was now 1,500 Rand per cell phone sold. We then realized that if that was the case, we would have sold 133 cell phones. And if we considered that 133 cell phones at 2017 prices, what we would have had if we had sold those cell phones in 2017 was GDP of 133,000. Therefore, we can say that the amount of real GDP in 2018 was greater than the amount of real GDP in 2017 if we just used 2017 prices. In other words, if we pr kept prices constant, our GDP in 2018 would have increased which means we would have had real GDP growth. What I left you with was a question, well, what happens if instead that 200,000 came with an increase in the price of cell phones in the, and that increase was instead of 1,500, it was 2,500, okay? Then the question was, well, what would the value of GDP have been in 2018 if we were using 2017 prices? Did anyone work that out? Someone did? Yes? What was it? Sorry, who said yes? Yeah? No? No? Sorry? 80. So there were 80 cell phones produced times 1,000 Rand for 2017 prices, and our real GDP would have been 80,000. Fantastic. Now, our 200,000 in 2018, as a nominal 
GDP value, if prices had increased to 2,500, would in fact only be real GDP in 2017 prices of 80,000. In which case, would our nominal GDP growth be indicative of real GDP growth? No, because we've actually had a decline, right? So our point is, looking at nominal GDP figures doesn't tell us anything about whether we've had real GDP growth, okay? We need to take into account price changes. Any questions at this point? Otherwise, I shall continue. No? Okay. <clears throat> Still measuring GDP, if we're looking at our <clears throat> uh, expenditure approach to GDP, here we've got a table. We've got production in 2005, sorry, not production, expenditure in 2005, consumption, was t-shirts, investment was in the form of computer chips, government spending was in the form of security services, and our total level of output, so our real GDP in 2005, given the price of each of these items and the quantity that we sold of each of these items, so price, or say quantity times, let's do this, Okay, quantity times price equals total expenditure. So expenditure on t-shirts, consumption expenditure, 500 million rand. Investment expenditure, 300 million rand. Government spending, 200 million rand. What was our total level of spending in 2005? 1,000 million rand. Okay. 2010. Consumption, investment, government spending, and total GDP expenditure. 200, 400, 2,400 total expenditure, 3,000 million rand. And our question now is, have we had real GDP growth or not? Okay? What we're going to do is we're going to set prices at stable in 2005. So we want to know 2010's output in 2005 prices, okay? So what do we have? 2010's output at 2005's prices, okay? So consumption four, four times 50, 50, equals 200, okay? 200 plus 200 plus 1,200. Total GDP in 2010 at 2,005 prices, okay? Quantities in 2010, prices at 2,005. GDP, 1,600 million rand. Have we had real GDP growth Yes, we have. Okay? Everyone happy with what we did in that diagram, in those tables? Okay? We produced more on average when the prices were taken into account as being fixed the total value of what we produced was greater than what we produced in 2005. So now we know how to measure GDP and we know the difference between nominal GDP and real GDP. Why are we interested in GDP at all? Okay, economists use estimates of real GDP. There's two primary things that we're going to look at. The first is to compare the standards of living over time as well as to compare standards of living across countries. So obviously in both instances, why are we interested in real GDP? Because it gives us some indication of our standard of living. 
The more stuff we produce, the more stuff we have, the happier we are, in theory. In fact, let me uh, make a mental note of that point. Does money buy you happiness? That's my question to you. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll go and hunt down a graph. I've seen it somewhere. I can't remember exactly where, so I'll have to find it again. Uh, it measures self-reported happiness. Self-reported happiness, I think, on this scale, on the Y scale, against monetary income. Okay, self-reported happiness against monetary income. Okay? I won't give away what it shows, but we'll take a look tomorrow. I think you will enjoy what it's... What, sorry? You're right. Not tomorrow. Yet. I will not be here tomorrow. Please do not come tomorrow. Uh, next week, Thursday, we will take a look at that diagram. Does money buy you happiness? Does having more goods and services and stuff make you happier? <laughs> So, let's continue with our textbook content. So, what happens to the standard of living over time? Well, there tends to be a long-term trend, and a handy way of comparing real GDP per person over time is to express it as a ratio of some reference year, okay? So, why do we want to compare, I mean, why do we want to adjust nominal GDP to real GDP because we want to take out any change in prices, right? And we want to know what is happening in the long term. And what we tend to find if we plot real GDP, okay, so not worried about price changes, but real GDP against time, we tend to find that it kind of goes like this. It goes uh, up and then down and up and down and sort of in this kind of wavy motion. But over time, It's kind of increasing, okay? So the long-term trends in real GDP over time has been an increase. Has there been an increase in happiness? When we look at this trend line, okay? So the line that I've drawn through here with an arrow, we call that the trend line. When we look at the growth in that trend line, we call that trend line potential GDP, okay? So potential GDP is the maximum level of GDP that can be produced while avoiding shortages of any of the factors of production, being labor, capital, land, or any kind of entrepreneurial inputs. That would bring about a rise in inflation. In other words, the amount of output that we can produce in general increases over time. The fact that it is sometimes above and sometimes below we have special terminology for that, which we'll get to in a moment. But this kind of average line that goes up generally is what we would call potential GDP. And we would expect potential GDP not to come with any kind of inflationary pressures. What tends to happen if we are above this line, if we are on this part of our, this little diagram that I've drawn where I'm above the trend line, tends to be accompanied by an increase in prices. In other words, we tend to have inflation. When we dip below that line, we tend to have a decrease in inflation and in some instances deflation. So our prices tend to go down or may go down, right? There is certainly deflationary pressure. So if we're on the trend, we tend to see a very minimal change in price. The fact that this real GDP, this potential real GDP, changes and goes up and down and fluctuates, we refer to this pattern as a business cycle. And our business cycle has a number of different stages. It has an expansionary stage. That's when it's going up. Okay? It has a recessionary stage. That's when it's going down. And we have two turning points. We have a peak 
when it changes from going up to going down, and then we have a trough when it changes from going down to going up. Okay? So if I add to my little diagram here, what would be an expansionary phase? We would tend to call that little part there an expansion. It's going up. This part where it's going down, whoops. This part where it's going down would be a recession. At this top point over here, that would be my peak. And at this point at the bottom, this would be my trough. Okay? When we measure our GDP, as was pointed out yesterday, we might not, in fact, capture everything that happens in our economy. In other words, even our measures of GDP that we have, our official measures of GDP, might not actually reflect accurately what is happening in the economy. So what are the sort of things that are not captured in real GDP? Well, first of all, household production. In other words, anything that I do at my house or anything you do at your house, if I change a light bulb, right? There are two ways in which my light bulb could be changed. I could change the light bulb myself or I could employ an electrician to come to my house and change the light bulb. If I employ an electrician and I pay an electrician, he records that in his books, he submits that in his tax return, it gets recorded in South Africa's GDP, right? Some value-added activity took place. A light bulb was changed. Fantastic. When I do that myself, that never gets recorded, right? Some sort of value-adding activity took place and it did not get recorded, okay? If I clean my house, no one gets paid for it, it does not get recorded. It does not form part of GDP. What we mentioned yesterday, underground economic activity. So anyone that chooses not to record any economic activity that takes place because they specifically don't want the tax man to know about it. And they might not want the tax man to know about it because they also don't want security forces to know about it, right? That we would call underground economic activity. So we could have a booming trade in illicit substances and... If it wasn't illegal, we could tax it and the government could get income. Instead, it's illegal. So, should the drug trade be made legal? And I want to have a hand up. Should it be legalized? Any opinion? Hand up for an opinion. Someone give me an opinion. Yes. No, it should not. And your reason? Sorry? Drugs would be more expensive. I like that, okay. You had your hand up? Yes? If it's legal, the government would have more control. So that's a good reason to legalize it, okay? Okay, so it's illegal and it's illegal to deter people using it and one of the reasons that we want to deter people from using it is because it has social negative social consequences and if we made it legal more people would use it and those negative social uh, consequences would increase and it would be a greater cost to society that was your point right okay yeah you're gonna have to shout yeah should be yeah because it would bring in taxes. I'm with you? Okay, yeah? Okay, I like this. So what did we learn from microeconomics? What is the best way to make a decision about resource allocation? Marginal benefits, marginal costs. As long as the marginal benefit outweighs the marginal cost, there is a positive contribution. 
The point that was raised over there was there would be a co positive contribution to the fiscus through taxes. The point that was raised there was there would be a negative social cost. The assumption from the gentleman over there was that the negative social cost necessarily outweighs the positive social benefit. Would there be a good way of testing this? Okay, does anyone know anything about drug use in Portugal? No? Okay. Heroin was legalized. Okay. You were not allowed to sell heroin, and you could only have a small amount on you, but it was legal to take heroin. Okay? Which means if you wanted to get medical assistance for your drug addiction, you could go to the hospital and say, I have a problem. They set up centers that if you had an issue with a drug addiction and you wanted to kick your addiction, they would give you heroin in small doses to help you break your habit. What do you think happened to drug use in Portugal, heroin? What do you think happened? It went down. Went down. What do you think happened to the medical costs of treating people with heroin problems? It went down. Do you know that South Africa has already passed at least tentatively the kind of laws that would make it legal to sell, well, maybe not sell, but to, uh, to consume marijuana? Oh, I thought you might know that, yeah. Yeah. So what would be an economic experiment? An interesting economic experiment would be how does a change in drug laws affect drug consumption? How does it affect costs to society? Well, we've already got one interesting case in Portugal. Do you know how much the United ooh, excuse me, do you know how much the United States spends on anti drug enforcement activities? I don't know offhand either, so what I'll do is I'll bring in next Thursday, and we can look at what that is as a percentage of GDP, right? What are the costs of enforcing an illegal drug trade? Well, which doesn't work very well, as I'm sure you know if you watch music videos <laughs> about lifestyles in the United States. Yeah? Did you want to raise a point? Uh, yep. Yes. Because of the legality of it, it's more yes. accessible, so more people will be comfortable. Yes. Into it. That would be the case, yes. Yeah, but you, with, the, with your study that you said. That Not my study, yes. <laughs> that you refer to. Yes. Uh, there's, uh, so for one person, basically, you could say that because they don't know how many people are using it. Yeah. Uh, you say to one person, about 10 people are dying. So the, the slow kick impact of that is you're putting one life that's more valuable than the other 10 lives. Are you asking? Are you asking? Is that the implication, or are you saying that's your interpretation of what's happened? Oh, so is that the implication? In other words, did legalizing it in Portugal have negative consequences? Right. So the point is, less people used the used were addicted to heroin and used heroin thereafter. So that would suggest, no, there was no negative consequence in the sense that suddenly everyone was using drugs. The medical costs associated with treating people with drug-related illnesses went down. That would suggest that, no, it didn't have a negative impact on, say, the healthcare system because of people using. So then the next point is to say, well, if, that, if there was no negative consequences from just doing that, what happens if we then legalize the actual trade of it 
but keep it in a very controlled situation like any other kind of medical, very potent medical substance, right? And then tax it. Correct. You don't know, like, if you go to the fountain, you don't know how many Correct. people are using it yet. Because Correct. you can't really... You also, have, you also have drug-related deaths. But then, how do we know that... Uh, someone's died of a heroin overdose. Yeah, you know if someone's died of a heroin overdose, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, there was one last point that someone wanted to make over there. So a hand. Are you done? Yeah? Okay, cool. Righty ho, underground economic activity. Then, real, um, real GDP. Does real GDP tell us anything about health or life expectancy? No, there's no measure of that in our real GDP measures. So, we could have a very, very rich country of very, very sick people, right? It doesn't tend to be that, that, that those two go together. It tends to be that the more GDP you have, the better kind of health you have, but it's not, yeah, it's not a given, put it that way. It doesn't tell us anything about leisure time. We know from observation that people like leisure time, right? Leisure industries are multi-trillion dollar industries globally. We know people like to enjoy themselves, right? Doing stuff that's just for fun. Okay. If you are working more and earning more, you might be having less time for leisure. Right? That's a negative consequence of you working more. A measure of GDP tells us nothing about that. What about the environment? Economic growth tends to come with environmental degradation. Right? That's not necessarily a good thing. Another thing, I'm just actually making some notes, hang on. Uh, another thing about environmental degradation that we should look up and just have a chat about next Thursday is um, quality of the environment in China and what it's like to live in China. Uh, what was the first thing I was going to get back to? Sorry? Sorry? That's it. Cool. Okay. So three things so far. And then... Real GDP tells us nothing about political freedoms and any kind of social justice. So one of the points that was made by a gentleman up there yesterday was what about things like equality? Does equality not matter? And is equality not something that is valued? Right? If it is, and it does, then our measures of real GDP tell us nothing about that, and that is potentially a problematic aspect. Righty-ho, at this point, we come to the end of that chapter, and he has a question. So you can grab out a piece of paper and a pen. This comes from some past tests. Okay. The nominal value. The nominal value of GDP in some place called Smallville 
was $750 million in 2005. Okay, nominal, oops, sorry. Nominal in 2005, $750 million. The average real growth rate, okay, so real growth rate, 6% in 2006, 5.5% in 2007. There was also a price level increase, okay, so the prices have also increased. They've gone from an average level of 100 in 2005 to 118 in 2007. Okay? So between 2005 and 2007, we've had real economic growth and we've had inflation, increase in prices. The question, therefore, is what is the value of nominal GDP in 2007? Right? Nominal GDP. 2007. The answer is already indicated here. It's option E. So, can you get option E? Okay. I'm assuming I don't need to spend too much time going through this because there's nothing too fancy happening here. Okay. Nominal GDP in 750 in 2005. And if we're looking at prices in 2007, uh, in, we're looking at nominal prices in 2007, then we need to know how the price changed as well as how much real output changed. So how much did real output change? Well, if we take 2005 as being our, what we would call our base year, we'll talk more about that in the next chapter, then we know whatever the value of it was in 2005, we can just fix it at that 2005 value. Real economic growth, 750 million times 6%, 1.06, oops, uh, sorry, times 1.06, then growth in 2007, 5.5, so times 1.055 gives you approximately, what value does it give you? Eight, eight what? Sorry, eight what? 838. Thank you. That's good enough. 838. Okay, and then 838 in, must also grow by an 18% price level, right? So we need 838 times 1.18 gives us approximately 990, right? Okay, 990. Did anyone not get that answer? Hand up if you did not get that answer. Okay, uh, without picking on anyone then, if I can just grab you because you're closest. Where did you go wrong? And then you? Okay, uh, sorry, Is anyone else that wants to give me feedback on what they, where they went wrong? Yeah? by the price change, okay. So there were two different types of change. There was a real growth rate change and there was a price change to get to nominal, right? Does anyone have any questions on what we did here? Or can I take it, I mean, put it this way. If there are no questions, I will then assume that you are now comfortable with what happened. In other words, you might not have got it the first time, but now you understand what we did. Alternatively, you have a question because you're still not 100% sure what it is that we did. Anyone got a question? Yeah? Absolutely. It's possible for them to have changed this question completely and be something totally different. Could work backwards. It could work from the middle down, middle up. Um, the important aspect of what this question is getting at is, do you understand how to do a change, a growth rate change, and the difference between real and nominal being real growth rates and, I mean, change in quantity and change in prices. Those are the, the different uh, concepts being discussed in this question and they could be presented in any number of different ways.
This is just one random example of a question from a test. Yeah. When you say those last two bits of information, which last two? Yes. I did not. Uh, oh, for just real, you're saying. So our real, we know, if we keep prices constant in 2005, we've already been told that our real growth rate was six and five and a half. Well, I didn't add them. I multiplied them because. Well, yeah, 750 grows by six percent. Then that new number grows by five and a half percent. So this is the real growth component, right? There was also a price change component. So I take this value and now I've got my price change component, right? They are two separate things and if they was just real, I could just do the one part, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Any other issues? Then I can assume for now that we can, we're comfortable with what's going on. You happy with that? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Good stuff. So let's take a 10 minute break and then we come back, we start chapter 22. And off we go. <laughs>